this is a talk about identity, about identity in a digitized world. Because we're all connected. We all use smartphones, tablets, computers, laptops, all connected to the internet. And perhaps some people are sending notes on Twitter now, posting Facebook updates. Connected is what's happening now. And we're all unique because we're individuals. And as an, as an individual, you develop your own personal identity. You make your choices for the short term, for the long term. You think about what you want to achieve, what you want to obtain in the future and who you want to be now. And it's different because you make explicit choices because what information you share differs for each context. So it differs what you share with your family, what you share with your friends at the sports club, what you share with your colleagues at work. And you make these choices. And to develop your own individual identity, you have to be able to make these choices. You have to have some form of control over the information you share and with whom you share this. And that we are all unique has been recognized by some web companies, which is nice. And it's illustrated in a TED talk uh, from a couple of years ago by Eli Pariser. And he talks about the filter bubble effect. And he shows that the search results from Google may differ for each person. So when you're sitting next to your neighbor, you're putting in the same search term, the results that pop up may differ because they are prefixed. And the results you see depend on your past web behavior. So links you click less often are simply filled out. And that's what makes the difference. There is a choice and the results you see, they are connected to your preferences, according to Google. And Paris warns for the risks this may have for democracy, because we might have tunnel visions. And he warns for the risk of our vision of the world in its entire form. And I want to take this to the more individual level. You are unique. You make these choices. But there's one thing which is important to know, because it might seem that these choices made by Google, like what information do we show you, this is the most relevant for you, this is according to your interest. It might seem that you have some form of control there because you make these earlier choices which form the basis for what's heading up on your screen right now. But it's not simply your preferences. What you see is based on a vision commercial companies have of your perceived preferences. Based on your clicking behavior, browsing behavior, location, they have a vision of who you are and what might be interesting to you. And according to this vision, they adapt the results you may see. As a result, numerous companies, and some bigger, some smaller, get a function as a sort of gatekeeper to content, to information, because they decide what information you can see and what information might be more difficult to find. And in some instances, this is more explicit. For instance, when they say, we are a gatekeeper, and you can think, for instance, about Facebook for websites, where you can use your Facebook credentials to log into another website or another web service. This is explicit, and they decide, okay, this is this person. We verify the identity, so he gets access. But more implicitly, the choice is made far more often, because there are these changes and these slight differences in the information you may see on your screen, and they differ for each individual. So there is a dependency. Commercial companies become gatekeepers and decide what information you may see. Now think of society in the next few years. We're heading towards a connected society, Internet of Things, one of the buzzwords we're hearing nowadays. And then it's not only clicks, because simply walking through a door may generate data. There's all kinds of sensor networks. And for instance, if you use public transport, you check in with a chip card. Uh, when you walk through a store and you carry a phone, there's Wi-Fi tracking. So your entire path through a store is made visible to companies. And mere presence generates data. And the traditional web environment gets translated to our physical environment. I call this an information trap, because the information that is available about you, that is collected about you, and which is used to have a vision of your perceived preferences, determines what information might be accessible for you. And it's narrowing down more and more, because every click you perform 
is a reconfirmation of earlier preferences that were made for you. And new technologies such as real-time web personalization will only boost this development. And it means that not only search results on Google, but also ordinary websites may be tailor-made at an individual level. And what you see might differ from what, you, what another person sees. And this goes very far. It's not only in what you see, but also in the form you may see it, because there can be made differences between the appearance of items on a website. For instance, if you click more often on an image than on an ordinary web link in text, the most appealing information might be presented as an image for you, because it will trigger you to pick this piece out of the website and to click on it. This is easy, of course, but commercial companies do not only have the interest of providing you with the most viable information and the most interesting information for you, there is a commercial interest as well. And it will result in the fact that this image, which is more appealing to you to click on, will present the preference of this commercial company because it's commercially more interesting, because it's more, because it's more in line with their preferences and the commercial benefits and the commercial preferences overrule your individual preferences. And you're not completely aware because it's just simply more difficult to find alternatives and to find other ways. And in the end, this takes away the opportunity to try new things and to develop new things. In a data-driven economy, data is key. So all data available about you will determine what is going to happen. And things become smart. We all talk about smart devices. But what is this smart? It's not that a device like a smartphone is really thinking. No, it's acting according to your preferences or your perceived preferences based on an algorithm which is programmed by another commercial company. And the commercial value of putting you into this information trap of pigeonholing people is very high because it's commercially relevant and it can steer people's behavior and people's choices. And there's one big contradiction going on here. You are in this pigeonhole and you are in your individual information trap. And for every person this might differ. But it's also the case that your personal information trap is also based on information available from others. Think, for instance, about the Amazon.com website, where you see these recommendations like, people also bought this book. People who bought this also did this. People who viewed at this item also looked at this item. So it's the steering and it's combining of information from different people which are similar to you. So it's a form not of personalization, it's a form of mass personalization. And in the end, you're not one unique individual, but you're one of many with the same uniqueness. That's contradicting, right? So the big question is how to escape from this information trap. How can we escape? Well, there have been people saying, okay, we should have access to these algorithms. We should have insight into the algorithms because then we can understand what's going on behind the screens and where certain decisions come from. I think this is far too complex. Usually, often in the companies using these algorithms, there's only one or two people at the most knowing what's going on because it's so complex, it's self-evolving. And um, the algorithms develop over time because they have self-learning analytics. Well, it's too complex, but you are recognized online because you are unique. And it's recognized that you are unique, but in fact, you are limited in this being unique. So this is a call to companies. If you use these algorithms and if you adapt web content on an individual level, think about the fact that individual identity is at stake. Because identity is what makes us human. It's what gives us dignity. And all different individuals, that's what makes society fun. Otherwise, it would simply be boring. So think about this. And if you personalize, do this if an individual asks for it. But more important, think about the fact that you do never structurally exclude people from certain options or certain information. Because in the end, this will boil down to indirect discrimination. And we shouldn't want this. 
So do not structurally exclude, and sometimes just show simple alternatives. Attractive new ideas, just to trigger the mind of people, to steer them and to trigger them to think about their identity, who they want to be and who they want to be in the future. And this will allow us to retain control over our identity. And this is what will allow us to be unique again. Thank you.